my question is about the uh, Kongangs. Uh, we've been doing these interviews for the last nine days. Um, my question is uh, our answering, our correct answering. If you take the 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 Zen combat, where could you place that, and uh, how does it function over there? Straight ahead. Your correct Kongan answer is going straight ahead. We say only don't know. That means an undivided, clear, simple mind. So Kongan answers actually help you in various ways. People believe, since we are conditioned to take exams and perform well at school, that if you answer the Kongan, you're done. Not like that. If you really cover the way to answer the Kongan, if you unload your karma in the meantime, if you transform in the meantime, if you transcend your own egotistical views in the meantime, then Kongan answer actually has done its job. And you have helped yourself and other beings by struggling through the maze of your own views, of your own opinions, and finally finding something which is not you but goes through you. So Kongan answers are wonderful because they are based on paradoxes. Those paradoxes that we human beings are struggling with, but Kongans bring them out in great detail and in some composed form, like a story, a situation, a dialogue or something. So when that happens, you are forced to look inside, deeper than usual. If your Kongan answers as sentences would help, we would give them to you in a book. You would learn them and you would be a very happy and enlightened person. But that's not the way it works. The way it works is that you are forced to use your own intuition beyond your own thinking, emotions, notions of past, present, future, etc. And when that happens, you are forced to change by your own intent and resolve to finish the Kongan. It's not the Zen teacher's influence that you want to answer the Kongan. It's your own will. That's why those who have stronger willpower, they are down to this business sooner than those who want things from the outside or are looking for external solutions. So Kongan answers are actually pointing always to the right direction. But I cannot place them on the Zen circle for you. There is no classified range for any Kongan, and this is between 180 and 270. This is between 90 and 120. If you look at Zen Master Hyang Gok's Kongans in the Howard Single Flower book, you find a lot of magic style Kongans. I barely ask them because for most of us they are not practical. In fact, at this point, uh, the way we are now, it would make people think more. But those are actually pointing to 270 degrees, generally. Because generally, on the Zen circle, 270 degrees is infinite freedom, infinite transformation. But in everyday life, there's very little use for them. So when you learn about truth and function, and as you progress with the Kongas that I give you, you are pointed to 360 degrees most of the time. But sometimes it's just 180. Sometimes it's really clear like space, clear like a mirror, and reflection comes next. So, in general, it's impossible to say where Kongans point. Individually, you might, but it would be a total and absolute waste of time. Why? Kongans are supposed to help you unload your unnecessary mental baggage. So why make more by thinking about them? Some people come and uh, they say, I've been reading this and this book of Kongans. And I say, why? Well, they're kind of interesting. And I say, don't you have bad dreams after that? Mm -hmm. Because if you overload yourself with undigested food, you have terrible dreams because of your bad digestion. If you overload yourself with unresolved Kongans, then your mind is getting down to a totally useless multitasking of thinking, thinking, thinking about Kongan A, B, C, and D subconsciously most of the time until something else takes its place. 
So when uh, I'm asked, you know, how I deal with that, I say, I don't read Kongan books. They're bad for your health. I use Kongans one at a time, whether I teach them or I learn them, whether I solve them or give others to solve. So in that way, Kongans are very important keys to open the doors behind which there's something important. Whether it's the world with some problems that you haven't finished, or your own person, your own subconscious, where something is unresolved and banging, okay, on the door. But the keys themselves are not the solution. That's why very few people actually can use Kongans literally in everyday life, fortunately. Think about some radical ones like Nam Chong killing a cat. Fortunately, you cannot use that directly in everyday life. Otherwise, there would be very different feedback from Zen practitioners all over the world. Okay? They are the keys that open the doors. And as the doors open and you have your experience, the experience itself, the answer itself becomes less important than what's behind the door. What actually opened up. Same is true about any meditation experience. Some people tell me, you know, Sunim, during sitting, this and this and this happened to me. To me. And I ask back, did it appear and disappear? Yes. Wonderful. That's not what we are looking for. What we are looking for is something that doesn't appear and doesn't disappear. Same thing is true with Kongans. The answers are great. Important to find them. But that's not actually what we are looking for. What we are looking for is the hand that finds the key. The mind that finds the solution. And that's why Kongan practice is fantastic. Because, as most of you know by now, you cannot unlock them by thinking. Or just emotional attitude. Or habits. Or any karma of the past, present and future. You have to have something else. And when you solve a conga and you start to believe that you actually have it. You know how many people forget primary point in the first three or four interviews? Many. And I stopped being frustrated about that. You know why? Because when you actually solve a conga, and then primary point actually is ingrained in you. Because you believe that it works. Why? Because it does. You got the feedback that it's correct and you have no idea how you solved it. But it works. So you can establish this solution on this no idea. You can have this functional experience of don't know. And then it starts to work in various situations, first in the interview room, then in the Dharma room, then in the outside world, then in your everyday life. And what's wonderful about it is that you cannot really display that as a special clothing or a special hairstyle or a special attitude that look how good my don't know mind is. Look how selfless I am. Do you see the irony here? So, that's why kungans are great. And that's why some paradoxes are good for everyone, if you have the way to solve them, okay? Could you please tell us more about the meditation? How does it influence the mind? I'm asking you this because sometimes I have the feeling that real answers come from real practice. And I'm not judging um, what you say as a teacher, but it's how we relate to your answers because we may apply them in different situations that don't fit. <clears throat> so, about the meditation, if you can, please. You apply my answers in different situations, that's terrible. It was an example, that's it. <laughs> so, meditation. What is meditation? Do you identify meditation with this form that we practice in the Dharma room? That's partially true, but not entirely. Meditation does not influence the mind. It's really important to see that. We influence each other. The world influences you, you influence the world. Meditation helps you make the mind clear. How? It switches you off. Switches the ego off. 
if you do it right. And then the mind, your true nature, can become clear. That's meditation. No influence. Only let the attachments fall off. There's a term in the Orient when they say meditation is heating up the heart. Literally, it means it purges all your attachments. Like you burn grass until nothing remains. Or if you have a mirror surface which has a lot of patches and taints, whatever on it, from various substances, lipstick, paint, fingertips. If you heat up the glass, everything starts to melt and it falls off. It liquidates, evaporates. So that's how meditation works because your mind gets again connected to the substance of the world. So your substance, whole world substance, one substance. Originally this is true, but our minds, cognitively and emotionally, we make so many thoughts and so many emotions that we separate ourselves from the world by being attached to them. That's our wall of self. So when you heat up the mind, this wall actually melts and evaporates. And this Tantian practice that we teach all the time means that you have a direct, undivided, energetic and mental connection to the world. We call this one mind or one energy. And that experience is what cleanses the mind. There is no influence. There is no such influence that from the outside or from the inside with a specific code would do the job. Okay? So that's why, just do it. When you notice that your sense of self appears, let it disappear. Come back to the floor. In the Kongan answers, come back to primary point. In everyday life, step back and don't attach to what people say, do, think and feel. See all of that, but don't attach to that, don't identify with that and don't judge that. And then you meditate. Originally, the Taoist word for meditation was Wu Wei, non-action. But this non-action actually means non-dualistic, non-reactive mind. It doesn't mean this non-action where you don't do what you're supposed to do. What this means is that you do not have dualistic mind. Dualistic mind that always forced to act, to move. So non-reactive, non-dualistic mind, that's Wu Wei. In other words, it is undivided, clear like space, clear like a mirror. Then comes Wei Wu Wei, moving while not moving, acting while non acting, being in this dualistic world without being dualistic. That's meditation. Um, because we are speaking about the practice and we've been in this retreat. I want to ask if you could tell us more about bowing and chanting and how does this break the ice and melt, boiling the water, as you say. I already said that, so you know. Why do you ask? Because I don't really get it. You don't get it? Yeah. So now you know everything you need to know and you only have to do it. Now, I tell you also a little bit more because you're hungry, so I have to yeah. give you food. <laughs> so, uh, bowing is very, very physical, okay? Because you do it with your body, primarily, but least of all with your body, most of all with your mind. So when you bow, you raise the Buddha above yourself. That's why you raise both hands, palms up, okay? Because your Buddha nature becomes way more important than your own self. So it symbolizes the self becoming infinitesimally small and the Buddha becoming most important. And as that happens, you condition yourself that your practice is meant for all beings. Your enlightenment is not for yourself. It's for the whole world, for all beings. So bowing actually means you repent for your karma. You don't generate a sense of guilt. But you admit you made mistakes and you leave all those mistakes behind. 
Making mistakes doesn't make you a bad person, but it leaves something to correct. And when you correct that, then your path becomes more attainable. Because you don't go left and right and up and down, you go straight. If we keep making mistakes, willfully or unconsciously, however we do it, we enter a new cycle of karma. And karma by itself is not good, not bad, but the cycle takes energy and time. In Korean, this is called won hang dong, circular action. Won is circle, hang dong is action. So it's such action, speech, thought, or emotion that results in repetitions. If repetitions become very prevalent, that results in your next lifetime. If you go straight, if you speak, act, feel and think in such a way that it doesn't repeat itself, then you can go beyond life and death. That's why you heard from our great teachers and Master Sung San, only go straight, don't know. I always wondered how is going straight and only don't know connected? How are they connected? The two actually are the same. So bowing makes you totally experience that. And it's a very clear, unequivocal representation and expression of your resolve, of your willpower. So you actually totally become one with the universe. When you bow correctly, you have that experience. And the next is chanting. During chanting, uh, it's like, again, the broken ice becomes warmed up. And when you chant, you totally flush your karma out. Because what you did before with your body, now you speak with your mouth. You chant with your whole being. So instead of having selfish desires or anger, what your mouth says is the name of the Buddha or the Bodhisattva. And your mind is oriented towards that. And it opens up uh, those possibilities in the mind that you haven't opened up before. And next is the sitting meditation. When the sun warms up the water and evaporates it. That's the job that everybody wants to do first. So when you look at Western practitioners, they only want to sit, mostly. They don't understand so much chanting. They understand mantra a little bit, but loud chanting or especially group chanting, most people don't see why they would do that. And bowing is the furthest because it's representing or expressing something that some people don't understand or a little bit shy of and something strange. I become different. Of course you become different, but in the way you want to be different. During sitting, you just perceive and it's directly just mind practice. Body already unmoving. Speech already unmoving. And now next, mind becomes unmoving. This clear like space, clear mirror mind is unmoving mind. Not reacting mind. When you don't make anything, don't hold anything, not want anything, not attached to anything. Okay? But... Each one of these three practices has its own virtues and also its role in everybody's practicing life. And that's why we have to recognize, maybe with the help of the teacher, what we should be doing. Okay? And do that. So our individual soul is uh, being reincarnated when we make uh, action that need to be solved. How did your reincarnation happen? Do you remember that? No. Neither do I. But we are here with this kind of mind. So we can really see what we carry. What happened before, we don't know. What's happening right now, that's our job. So what kind of willpower do you have? What kind of direction do you have with your desire or anger or ignorant views? Or wisdom, compassion, and selfless help. What is the direction of all that? So that's why Zen works with the moment. In fact, we don't work with the individual soul as an entity because it doesn't have a clear definition or boundaries or attributes. Okay? So right now, 
What do you have in your mind? Right now, what do you want? Right now, how you relate to other people? What kind of life you live? That's what matters. That's why the Diamond Sutra says, the mind which is divided into past, present and future cannot get awakening. Okay? More questions? Uh, my question. Uh, can you give maybe a brief explanation about uh, the four Zen principles or pillars uh, of Bodhidharma? Well, the four principles of Zen are attributed to Bodhidharma, rightfully so, because he put them into final form as we know it. But as principles, they date back centuries before him. In fact, these principles are so important that I would call them the fundamentals without being fundamentalist. Because the first is not depending on the scriptures. So if you want to be a fundamentalist, you depend on some scriptures. In fact, you attach violently to your own version of that text or the meaning of that scripture. But Zen transcends all of that, whether you are an understanding of a sutra or anything as a holy text is harmonious or not. Do not depend on the scriptures. Because if you do, you identify the factory with the product. Instead, number two, directly pointing to human mind, the source of those scriptures. So try to attain the mind that the Buddha had, not just read the sutras or the writings of the patriarchs. That's why kongans serve as keys, but they are not what's behind the door. And they are not the hand that opens the door. So this directly pointing to human mind means that there is no special layer of symbols or systems or any kind of human or other shield that would cover your karma from you, that would kind of blindfold you on the way. And you directly perceive who you think you are, and if you keep doing that, you actually attain who you truly are, or what you truly are. The third one is that awakening means that you attain your true nature. There are many definitions of enlightenment, just like there are many definitions of God in the Western Hemisphere. But if you attain your true nature, that means you are awakened. And that ensures that no enlightened self appears. Because the self cannot get enlightenment. That's really important. When that disappears and this oneness becomes yours, then you attain your true nature and that is awakening. And the fourth is mind-to-mind -mind transmission independent of external circumstances. So it's not the ceremony that makes a Zen master. It's the awakening and the mind-to-mind -mind connection to the teacher that makes a new Zen master. That's really important to see. Because otherwise you would believe that somebody who has a horse hair whisk or a special set of bows or a golden kasa or whatever color they give him or her, that would be the surefire proof that this person has some kind of attainment. That's not true. So the four principles of Zen is actually what makes this uh, spiritual lineage in its total variety of uh, Mahayana in China, Korea and Japan uh, so direct and so clear. You can make religion out of it, but this is not a religion. It's beyond religion. You can make some kind of systematic knowledge out of it, but it's not a systematic set of rules or knowledge. It's using that, but it's beyond that. It has attributes of various kinds, but it doesn't depend on these attributes. Again, read the Diamond Sutra. Suputi asked the Buddha about the 32 distinguishing marks of the Buddha. And of course, the Buddha says what they are. And then he asks, Suputi, do you know how a Buddha is truly recognized? No, awakened one. Please teach me. He says, Suputi, true Buddha is recognized by not depending on the 32 distinguishing marks of the Buddha. It's fantastic. The four principles of Zen, they are really helpers and pointers that if you want to have transcendental wisdom, become one, wake up and help this world. What kind of principles do you have to follow? And if you follow them, there are results, good results. 
when I read something, uh, I, I cannot figure it out if I'm totally present or I'm just the reading or when I cut vegetables, I'm the cutting of the vegetables or I have to know somehow, not by knowledge, but to know that I'm cutting the vegetables. So, uh, what? If you have this kind of thinking, you'll cut your finger. <laughs> <laughs> so, when you clean, cut, or process vegetables, just do it and be aware of it. This awareness is not knowledge. When you read, just read. If you think about reading, whether am I really reading or not? <laughs> then you really cannot understand what's going on because you don't connect to the text. So it's very simple. I understand your sincere intent to improve the quality of what you're doing, but that's not the way to do that. Your intellect here doesn't serve you well. It doesn't serve anybody at this point too well. So if you overthink it, then it doesn't work. If you just do it, become one with it, be aware of it, f be focused at it, then you're there. But if you think about it, if you want to know about it, if you want to have an abstract layer over it, you kill it. That's why they said in the Orient, this arm is good as it is. Why chop it up into small pieces? <laughs> okay? Okay. Good. So, this is the closing talk of the retreat, and I really appreciate everybody's effort. Those people who came from far away from different countries, uh, it's a special treat to have you here. It's wonderful. I really hope to see all of you again, practicing together in one way or another. And uh, please understand and be aware that your presence in this temple is important, and we kindly welcome you back at any time. Thank you very much.